Next up, we got Andrew Blower with Oregon DOT, coatings engineer. He's going to talk about replacing a zinc compressed current anode on a 1932 coastal concrete arch bridge. So today we'll be talking about replacing an anode that's reached the end of its service life, an arc sprayed anode on a 1932 coastal arch bridge. We'll be taking an, a quick look at the overview of Oregon's impressed current cathodic protection program, uh, the history of the Cape Creek Bridge, which is what we'll be looking at today, project overview, uh, a deep dive into construction, and then hopefully a, a little opportunity for some question and answer at the end. So we can't really talk about uh, the ICCP program in Oregon without talking about the demolition of the Alsi Bay Bridge. This bridge was built in 1936. As you can see, it was a very beautiful structure and unfortunately it had a lot of corrosion issues to the point where it was being inspected weekly because we were worried it was going to collapse. Eventually a new bridge was built and it was demolished in 1991. There were some other things going on with construction of that bridge. They were playing with concrete admixtures which led to some low pH of the concrete, some other things that, that led to its demise, um, not just being on the coast, um, but that's a conversation for another day. Community was upset that that bridge was taken out, beautiful historic structure, and we didn't want to do that again. So that led us to explore cathodic protection. So the first anode that we installed um, in an ICCP configuration was a graphite anode, and it was in 1987. And it was on the Quinta Bay Bridge on the coast, uh, central coast in Oregon. This picture was taken, uh, I believe, in 2017. Um, on the left there, you can see one of the two spans that was protected by the graphite anode. The rectifier, ironically, has uh, corroded through the cabinet and the circuitry uh, stopped functioning, I would guess, somewhere around 1995 through 1997, somewhere in there. So um, it hasn't been receiving power for quite a while, but you can see the bridge is still in really good condition. There's some minor spalling, but, but that's it. On the right there, you can see span four, which is an adjacent span. It never had any repair work done to it, and you can see there's extensive spalling there. Uh, right now, there's an active project on this bridge to address all this and install a, uh, uh, a new anode, arc sprayed zinc anode on this bridge. And both those pictures were taken on the, on the same visit. Uh, and that's a really good, uh, good uh, showpiece to uh, discuss the effectiveness of impressed current cathodic protection. So an overview of our inventory, uh, we have 15 bridges with ICCP systems on it. 14 utilize arc sprayed zinc anodes. One is a rolled on graphite anode. That does not include the one I just showed you. That one is getting replaced. Uh, while these systems are expensive, they are approximately 10% of the replacement value of these structures. I'll put a little asterisk next to that because we only apply these because they are expensive to structures that are nearly irreplaceable due to historic significance, um, if there are a lot of staging concerns um, because of uh, wetlands, uh, seismic considerations. Typically these are put on structures that are very expensive to replace or have historical significance. So to, I'm sure this will come up in the end, so I'll go into costs a little bit. New anode installation for an arc sprayed zinc anode tends to go about $90 to $100 a square foot, and that's total project cost for that installation, um, including access and containment. And a replacement of that anode is somewhere in the $70 to $80 a square foot range. This is a bridge we're talking about today. This is a Cape Creek Bridge on US 101 on the coast of Oregon, bridge number 01113. Construction was completed in 1932, had uh, impressed current cathodic protection and arc sprayed zinc system and ins installation completed on that in 1991, and our reinstallation of the zinc anode was completed in 2020. So some bridge information, if you're not familiar with Oregon, Portland's up there in the top center, and the Cape Creed Bridge is on the central coast down there on the lower left. Uh, it spans the uh, Cape Creek and access to the Hesita Head Lighthouse uh, State Scenic Area. Really pretty area. 
Uh, if you're in the area, I definitely recommend you go there. Uh, 619 feet in length, 36 feet, three inches, out to out width, 27 feet curb to curb. It features a two-tiered Roman aqueduct style architecture, 27 main spans, and a 220 foot open spandrel arch span. There are also these arched uh, false spill through abutment type structures. So I'll kind of show you what those look like. So here are some original uh, construction photos I was able to dig up. I just threw them in here because I, I think they're really neat to look at. You can see in the center one that approach structure there with the, the false uh, wall in front. It's really an RCDG span, but it has a false uh, arched wall in front of it. Um, and it's really hard to photograph because there's a lots, lots of vegetation around it now, but you can see that uh, abutment structure really clearly here in the original construction photos. Also able to find um, some inspection photos from 1977. I apologize, they're kind of poor quality, but if the lighting's okay. You can see there are small, shallow rebars on the deck soffit and along the stringers. Um, there's also spalls along the uh, columns as well. So that's 1977 is when we were noting that uh, corrosion damage from, from being exposed to the coastal salty air. The first arc sprayed zinc anode, uh, this was the first bridge that had this system installed on it. It was installed between 1989 construction completing and 1991. On the left there was uh, is a photo of the original installation. They had a giant hard-sided containment structure they used to install it. Um, and on the right there is uh, an example of what the arc spray application looks like. I believe that's probably a staged photo because that application has about uh, mid 80s um, uh, transfer efficiency of the zinc to the surface. So it's a really dusty application typically. So I'm, I'm questioning whether they actually have zinc running through the, the sprayer at that moment to get that photo. Programming anode replacement. It was always assumed that the service life of these arc sprayed anodes lived somewhere in the 20 to 25 year range. So this was supported by regular inspections as well as data loggers that we have on the bridge monitoring uh, rectifier out outputs, as well as embedded reference cells in the concrete that would measure uh, potentials of the rebar um, as the system aged. Funding and design for anode replacement for this particular bridge um, was in place and we were able to get it funded um, at, the, at 28 years of age. Uh, here was a inspection photo just prior to the, uh, during design just prior to the project being let. Uh, I really like this photo because it shows uh, what what the condition was at the end of the service life of the anode. You could see a lot of corrosion products from the zinc have built up on the surface. Um, the zinc has delaminated in a lot of areas. Um, even the epoxy failed that was holding on that junction box there. And that junction box uh, for that rebar connection has fallen away from the structure. Also note that that uh, handhold for inspection access, we they, the inspectors no longer use that, so we took that out as part of the project. Items, it's the replacing the anode, it's the same work items as installing a new anode, except you obviously have to remove the remnants of the existing anode. So existing anode removal, I'll dive into that deeper in just a moment. Uh, near surface metal locating and removal. Um, importance of that is you don't want a short circuit path, short circuiting your uh, electrical uh, current or ionic current flow in the um, concrete, you want that, that current flow protecting your steel and any tie wires, nails that fall in your form, tools that might have fall, fallen in the forms, those can, can short out your system and you won't be effectively protecting your reinforcing bars. Rebar continuity checks and continuity welds, you want to make sure all your rebar is touching um, so you are protecting all of your rebar. Um, this is a good example of a repair where that, that uh, was done in 1991. That rebar was not tied in properly to the existing rebar, so it wasn't protected with the rest of the bridge when uh, uh, impressed current was applied. We then do a half cell potential survey, and that tells us where we place our reference cells within the bridge um, to monitor it. And then we got to install our electrical wire, wiring and 
rectifier cabinets as well to um, impress current in the system. So here's some typical pictures of our access and containment our contractor used. It was quite a massive containment structure. The area was frequented by Native Americans, so we had to have them put crane pads down. They couldn't, they couldn't dig or pour any footings, so it was all spread footings on crane pads. The abutments were uh, fill, so they could do some minor digging there if they needed to, but um, they couldn't disturb the surface. So this is how they access the bridge. They hung a platform across the arch there um, and then used that to, to build scaffolding off of. And on the right there, you can see what it looks like when they have their full containment up. So one of the biggest concerns when reapplying these anodes um, is how they're removing the anode. Uh, ODOT did a study back in, I believe it was 1994, working with a contractor to see um, at what point do you have issues with the arc sprayed zinc bonding to the surface. And they found when you started exposing more than about 50% of the aggregate with your removal methods, that zinc would have a hard time bonding to the surface because it doesn't, doesn't like to bond to the aggregate as, as well as it will to the concrete paste. We went with a wet abrasive blast method in our specs to try and combat this, to leave as much of the concrete paste um, uh, in place as possible. Of course, that's going to slow down the contractor's production rates, so, so he tried everything under the sun um, in terms of uh, abrasive, um, uh, tried to get us to buy off on some different dry blast methods to improve uh, production rates. None of those um, really met that 50% exposed aggregate requirement that we had in our specs, so we remained with the wet blast. Eventually, they actually uh, wanted us to let them try this uh, medium pressure hydro, hydro demolition unit that allowed them to fine tune their pressures, and it actually worked really well. Uh, you can see there on the right that it actually left a lot of the original um, uh, float finish on the, on the concrete surface, so we were really happy with that. So that's going to allow the zinc to bond and distribute current effectively. I'm not sure that economically it worked out as well as the contractor would have liked, but we were really happy with the, with the end product and, and that, that, that's what they ended up proposing and, and using for the rest of the project. So looking at some of the concrete repairs, um, leaky joints are always a problem. That was where we found the anode failed first. Looking at potential surveys for this bridge, the bridge actually remained really passive even as the anode was failing on it. The only areas that had active corrosion starting again was really at the joint locations where the anode had failed prematurely from water getting in there and consuming that anode a lot faster. Originally, they also used uh, shotcrete repairs instead of the, the pumped uh, form patch repairs that we do, do now. Um, and most of them actually sounded out okay and held up really well, but around the joint areas, uh, like you see on the left there, there was some additional repair to be done. On the right there, um, that sounded out as bad concrete, turned out to just be poorly consolidated concrete um, uh, in a column, which uh, you find a lot on these older structures. Typically, we would maybe not even touch that because it's been there for, for so long um, and the structure's behaving just fine. Um, you run into issues, though, because you want good um, current distribution around those bars. So we did have them, them chip that out and repair it. Here's another repair at Cross Brace in one of the bends. I don't know if you can see that, but someone lost their yardstick in that form. <laughs> I'm sure someone in uh, 1931, 1932 was looking for their yardstick the next day, and uh, we finally solved that mystery. And on the right there is just an example of uh, corbel repair at a, at a deck joint. Also of note in that picture is some of the Near surface metal, if, uh, if there was, um, if the concrete was sound um, and, the, and there was shallow near surface metal, we would put epoxy over it instead of uh, chipping it out um, so it wouldn't short the system. Just like working on an old house, working on an old bridge, sometimes you find some issues. At uh, Bent 7, we saw some restricted movement and cracking issues. On the left there is uh, the bronze bearing and seat condition. There's some loss of bearing area and uh, some cracking in the fixed back wall and column uh, behind it. And that crack went full depth actually through the other side. You can see where it spalled out the, uh, the corbel on the back side where it, was, it wasn't reinforced down there at the bottom. Um, that cracking also was occurring at the lower, lower beam uh, adjacent to the joint. So the contractor suggested jack the bridge, 
We restore the, the bearing pads, um, the loss of bearing area, and we saw cut it to allow free movement. Makes sense, right? But I noticed that this crack was regular along this beam all the way down the bridge. So I said, hmm, this, this is probably a bigger problem. We should get, get some more folks out here to take a look at it. And we did. Um, and then we started digging into the, the history here uh, of uh, what was going on. After several site visits and looking at historical records, we actually found that, that this wasn't a joint issue at all. It was the, uh, the fill from the abutment was actually pushing on the bridge and causing pressure along the bridge and, and, and sealing up that joint. And it had been that way since 1937. And here's uh, that inspection report from 1937 showing that. So jacking the bridge, saw cutting, doing all these things would have been the exact wrong thing to do because it would have caused even more movement, even more settlement, and, and probably additional damage to the bridge. So this 1937 report showing that these issues had been addressed in the substructure at the abutment and these defects had been stable for that long told us that we should probably just leave well enough alone, and we did. So some missed details during scoping and design. Several details were still under development in 1991 with regards to CP. We were working to try to determine the optimum size of our zones that we break down CP uh, to distribute current. And they didn't actually drill out the near surface metals in these jobs. They just put mastic pads over it. And we didn't realize that in the uh, in the scoping phase. So that was discovered during construction, which led to significant bid item overruns. Um, thankfully, it was a per each bid item. So, um, so it, it did cost us, um, cost us some, but uh, at least it was a per each, so we could, we could pay that out to the contractor. We also updated some details that didn't work so well. Here's a rebar connection that um, was not encapsulated, and that rebar is, is toast. It's completely corroded. So we went back and repaired all those. We chipped out around it. We welded a, a, a splice in there and repaired that rebar. But on the right there, that's our new detail that we've been using for a few years where we encapsulate um, the uh, brass threaded rod we use for our rebar connections in epoxy so we don't have dissimilar metal issues there when connecting to the rebar. And then we backfill the whole thing so there's no exposure there. Um, and that's ready for a junction box installation. At our power distribution, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Uh, we went back with the same configuration we had before. It was hidden nicely within the, the footprint of the bridge, pretty much out of public eye as much as it could be inside the lower beams and inside the columns. And with that, it was, uh, it was a su successful project. We just turned it on last year, and uh, it's running now, and we hope to get another 20, 25 years. Uh, don't see why, why we wouldn't out of this. And uh, it's one of my favorite bridges in Oregon, so I was happy to, happy to work on it. So any questions? You chose to use uh, zinc as a current carrier, essentially. You are able to place it on the surface of the concrete and just the impressed current system then it's distributing the current? Yeah, it's a distributed arc sprayed zinc anode, and we've been using that for, well, since 1991. Yeah, yeah so you, uh, using like titanium mesh or anything like that, you're just using a surface supplied anode. Okay, yep. Do you do any top coats over top of that? Um, no, no. We're just letting it, it's just exposed to the atmosphere. How many zones would you have on this type of a structure? Oh, I need to go back and look. Um, we have three cabinets that can hold 10 rectifiers each, but the lot not full. I think we have 18 on this bridge, if I remember correctly. We found the optimum zone size just through trial and error. This was the trial and error bridge, the first one. Uh, optimum size to be around 5,000 square feet per, per zone. Um, sometimes, if if the giant geometry is not too complex, we can get up to about 7,500 square feet. I don't like to go much above that, though. Hey, Andrew, what's the typical uh, current output and voltage, per, you know, approximately in yeah. each of the circuits? And two, what's the thickness uh, of that uh, sprayed zinc that you used, and uh, what kind of uh, adhesion strength you got? Okay, so first we, we run it in a constant current configuration, and let me make sure I get the units right. I believe it's 2 milliamps per square meter, which works out to what, 0.22 milliamps per square foot, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. And then driving voltage um, 
It obviously changes a bit seasonally. <laughs> Usually, initially, we're at we're at um, only a, only a couple volts, around two volts. You know, obviously, when it gets towards the end of the the anode service life and a bunch of it starts debonding, our voltage starts to shoot up, and that's when we know we're getting towards the end of our service life there. So but under normal normal operation, we're around two volts. Gotcha. What was the thickness and the adhesion? Yeah, thickness and adhesion, uh, I believe 15 mils is our thickness. Um, and adhesion, it can vary a little, but typically we get really good adhesion um, results um, in the, the 400 PSI range. Uh, our, our minimum we need to meet is uh, is 50, but we, we we usually never get anything below below 100, and usually that's when a pull test is right on a piece of aggregate. So, okay, so it's a 100 psi is the minimum you got. Typically, it's about 350, 400. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somewhere around around 400 is typically what, okay. what we end up getting. Yeah. Who is the contractor that did the work or will be doing the work? Uh, this one was uh, Hamilton Construction. Yeah, Hamilton Construction in a joint effort with uh, Great Western Corporation. Thank you, Andrew. Yep, thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.